The long-range desert group, under Major Stirling, had the task of finding a route for a whole British tank division through the mountainous country further to the south. From then on, the hunt for Stirling, as we called it, began. Sometimes we found vehicle tracks which could only have come from his scout cars. But time and again, this clever unit managed to evade our clutches. A couple of weeks later, a patrol succeeded in catching one of the long-range desert group's command cars, which had lost its way. In the vehicle, we captured a map on which was marked the exact route across a mountain range by which a whole British tank division might have attempted a wide outflanking of our prepared positions on the coast. Thanks to this map, Rommel was able to save parts of the Africa Corps from the threat of encirclement. In time, we got to know the names of the commanders of the two British reconnaissance battalions. I, too, was often addressed by prisoners. You are Major von Luck. We'd have been glad to catch you. While the Africa Army was putting every effort into fighting an orderly withdrawal action on the coast and then straight across Cyrenaica, we, with our four battalions, were able to operate freely for three weeks unmolested by tank and air attacks. We quickly developed a certain routine. Toward five o'clock in the afternoon, the reconnaissance patrols broke off their operations in order to reach base in good time. In the treeless desert with no landmarks, it was impossible to find one's way back to base in the dark. To avoid betraying our position, light signals were used only in an emergency. The two British battalions carried on in the same way, so that from 1700 hours, all reconnaissance and combat activity was suspended, to be resumed again the following morning as soon as it was light. We could really agree to a ceasefire with the British from 1700 hours until the next morning, I said, more as a joke, to those around me. Why not? I was supported by Lieutenant Wenzel Luedecker, the reserve officer who had worked at the UFA film studios as an assistant director. After all, he went on, the British have a sense of humour. We ought to suggest it to them. Chance came to our aid. One evening, when all our patrols were back, I received a visit from my intelligence officer. The Royal Dragoons are on the radio, he said and they would like to speak to you. Hello, Royal Dragus here. I know it's unusual to make radio on contact with you, but Lieutenant Smith and his scouting party have been missing since this evening. Is he with you? And if so, how are things with him and his men? One of our patrols had indeed managed to take some prisoners. It turned out that they were Lieutenant Smith and his party. Yes, he is with us. All of them are unhurt and send greetings to their family and friends. Then came the brainstorm. Can we call you too, or the 11th Hussars, if we have anyone missing? Sure, your calls are always welcome. It was only a matter of days before we had arrived at a gentleman's agreement. At 1700 hours precisely, all hostilities would be suspended. We called it tea time. At 1705 hours, we would make open contact with the British to exchange news about prisoners, etc., in fact, from a distance of about 15 kilometres, we could often see the British get out their primus stoves and make their tea. The agreement was kept by both sides until we were forced by events to give up the connection in Tunisia. The prisoners we took often had to stay with us for several days until the next supply convoy arrived and was able to take them away with it. We gave them whatever we could spare from our rations. One evening, when our radio stations had tuned in once again, to the Belgrade transmitter, and we heard the song Lily Marlene. Some of the prisoners joined in. Over there we listened to Lily Marlene every evening, they said. There's already an English version. Monty has strictly forbidden it, but we like the song and its sentimental words. The French and the Americans also listened to it, as we found out later. Somehow it made things easier. Our five o'clock tea agreement had some remarkable consequences. One evening, a patrol came back with two men and a jeep captured in the desert. A tall, fair-haired young lieutenant and his driver were brought before me. The lieutenant was the snobbish, arrogant type of Englishman. Very correctly, he gave me his service number only, no other details. I tried to get into conversation with him and told him of my visits to London, 
of my friends, including a captain in the Grenadier Guard. He gradually thawed and turned out to be the nephew of one of the owners of Player's Cigarette. My officers made a whispered suggestion and I had to laugh. Lieutenant, what would you say to our swapping you and your driver for cigarettes? We're a bit short at the moment. Good idea, he said. How many cigarettes do you think you are worth? What should I suggest to your commander? His answer came without hesitation. A million cigarettes! That's 100,000 packets! My radio officer made contact with the Royal Dragoons, and I passed on our offer. Please wait, we'll come back to you at once, was the reply. Then, after a few minutes, Sorry, we're a bit short ourselves, but we could offer 600,000 cigarettes. Come in, please. To my great astonishment, I received a flat refusal from the young lieutenant. Not one cigarette less than a million, that's final, was his answer. So, the young man had to pay for the high value he set on himself with captivity. A week later, shortly before dark, our doctor disappeared behind a rise for the indispensable spade trip. Doctor, I called out to him, don't go too far, it'll soon be dark. He didn't seem to hear me and went on. When he hadn't come back after half an hour, we began to be worried. The doctor was not only very popular, with his tropical experience, he was vital to us. We sent out some men and fired the prearranged light signals. The doctor remained missing. Had he lost his way, or had he been caught by the British? Yes, we've got your doctor. He ran straight into our patrol on its way back. This time, we have a suggestion. The Japanese have cut our communications with the Far East. We can't get quinine anymore and are suffering badly from malaria. Can we exchange your doctor for some of your synthetic atebrin? Come in, please. Please wait, I replied. A moral issue now presented itself. Which was more important, to weaken the fighting strength of the British through malaria, or to get our doctor back? I quickly made up my mind. OK, we'll do business. How many packets do you want for the doctor? We agreed at once on a quantity that we could spare and arranged the exchange for the following morning. From either side, a jeep with a white flag drove between the lines for the ceremonial trade. An expensive spade trip, Doctor. Good to have you back. Rommel, to whom I related this on one of his visits, was understanding. That's what I thought about the British. I'm glad you can practice this fair play here in the desert. On the coast, it's just a matter of survival. Only once was our agreement unintentionally broken. One evening, a patrol returned to base from its operation with a British supply truck. The leader of the patrol was a young lieutenant who had joined us from Germany only a short time before. Major, he reported proudly, the truck is full of corned beef and other tins, beer and cigarettes. When and where did you capture it? was my first question. It turned out that he had captured the truck towards 1730 hours, hence after the agreed time. Are you mad? You know the arrangement? This will not be the end of the matter. The lieutenant was astonished. But these are things that are really useful to us, and which will be denied to the British. War is war. I had an idea of what would happen, and at once sent off a radio message to Rommel. Have impression that British patrols intend to outflank us in the south. Suggest moving south. Rommel agreed, and sent word that another small unit would take over my position the following day. I briefed the leader of the unit on the situation in my area and warned him expressly against British patrols, which would appear suddenly and try to take prisoners among us. In the afternoon, I moved south. What I had suspected promptly occurred. In the evening, towards 1730 hours, a British detachment raided the unit, captured two trucks and disappeared into the darkness. A gentleman's agreement was, after all, a gentleman's agreement. The end of our agreement came later, somewhere in the depths of the Tunisian desert. For some days, we had lost contact with the two British battalions. Then, an orderly came to my command car one evening. There's a Bedouin here who wants to talk to you, Major. With a deep bow, the Bedouin came in. Salam, I have a letter for you. I will wait for an answer. A Bedouin with a letter. Here, 
deep in the desert, where by rights no one could find us. The Bedouins always seemed to know where we were. I opened the letter. From CO, Royal Dragoons. Dear Major von Luck, we have had other tasks and so were unable to keep in touch with you. The war in Africa has been decided, I'm glad to say, not in your favour. I should like, therefore, to thank you and all your people, in the name of my officers and men, for the fair play with which we have fought against each other on both sides. I and my battalion hope that all of you will come out of the war safe and sound, and that we may find the opportunity to meet again sometime in more favourable circumstances. With the greatest respect, I sat down at the table and wrote a similar note to the Royal Dragoons. Give this letter to the man from whom you received the one to me, I told the Bedouin. Say to him, many thanks, but don't betray where you found us. Heavy downpours of rain set in, which gave us time to consolidate the Mercer El Brep position. The deluges of rain were a hindrance, not only to us, but also to the two British battalions. We couldn't use the wadis, which gave us cover, for torrents of water, three feet deep, were carrying all before them. We were now stationed south of Aged Abia, not far from the border between Cyrenaica and Tripolitania. On 20 other November, I was ordered to go in the Fisola to Rommel, who, for a short time, had his HQ near an airfield. Rommel looked exhausted. His uniform was worn and dusty. The hard withdrawal actions, his deep disappointment and his illness, not yet fully cured, had left their mark on him. He greeted me briefly. Instead of giving me fresh orders, for which I had flown to see him, Rommel took my arm. Come, we'll go for a little walk. General Gauss nodded to me, as if pleased to be able to divert Rommel somewhat. We strolled along the edge of the airfield. I no longer know how to cope with the supply problem, Rommel began. A few days ago, an Italian destroyer with 500 tonnes of fuel turned west and unloaded at Tripoli instead of here in Benghazi. Kesselring has now promised me fuel by airlift. The first 50 JU-52s are on their way here. In the distance, we could hear the drone of engines. Also, however, the rattle of anti-aircraft cannon. Out of the 50 machines, only five landed shortly afterward. The rest had been shot down over the sea. How could the British have known about them? We know today that it was Jean Howard and her friends in Bletchley Park at work. Rommel was extremely frustrated and stamped his feet. Luck, that's the end. We can't even hold Tripolitania, but must fall back on Tunisia. There, in addition, we shall come upon the Americans and possibly also the French, who are supposed to be marching with a combat group from Chad through the desert on southern Tunisia. What I was afraid of weeks ago will then occur. Our proud Africa army and the new divisions that have landed in northern Tunisia will be lost. First, the loss of Stalingrad, with 200,000 battle-tried men. Now we're losing Africa too, with elite divisions. I was much disturbed. Field Marshal, we still have a chance. The men are behind you. Their morale is first class. If we can get sufficient supplies, we're bound to pull it off. Rommel smiled. I know, and I'm proud of the men. But the supplies will not be forthcoming. Hitler's HQ has already written off this theatre of war. All he requires now is that the German soldier stands or dies. What we need is to create a German Dunkirk. That means flying out as many officers, men and specialists as possible to Sicily while leaving the materiel behind. We need the men for the decisive struggle in Europa. How will you ever put that to Hitler? I asked. After consulting Kesselring and the Italians, I shall fly to Hitler at Rustenburg and make my opinion clear to him, beyond all doubt. My word still counts for something. I am still among the people and by my men. I don't believe any more that we shall get what we need in further divisions, aircraft and supplies in order to turn the wheel yet again. His face was lined, his shoulders drooping. He was the picture of dejection. Luck, the war is lost, he said. I was appalled. Was everything to have been in vain? We're still deep in Russia, I protested. Half Europe is occupied by us. Bitter though the loss of North Africa will be, we can carry on the fight in Europe 
and bring about a change of fortune. Luck? We've got to seek an armistice, precisely because we still have a lot of pawns in hand. If possible, an armistice with the Western allies. We still have something to offer. This assumes, of course, that Hitler must be forced to abdicate, that we must give up the persecution of the Jews at once and make concessions to the Church. That may sound utopian, but it is the only way of avoiding further bloodshed and still more destruction in our cities. What had brought Rommel to this complete reversal in his attitude to Hitler and the war? Without doubt, his great disappointment at being left on his own, as well as the disregard for his ideas and the importance of this theatre of war. We walked back slowly to his HQ. Once again, Rommel took my arm. Luck, one day you will think of my words. The threat to Europe and to our civilised world will come from the east. If the people of Europe fail to join forces to meet that threat, Western Europe will be lost. At the moment, I see only one warrior prepared to champion a united Europe. Churchill. I was deeply impressed by Rommel's words. As General Gauze told me at the beginning, Rommel had a decisive conference with Marshals Kesselring and Cavalera on 24 November. On 28 November, he flew to Rustenburg in East Prussia to see Hitler. The crucial meeting had the opposite effect of that for which Rommel had hoped. Hitler regarded Rommel as sick and run down, and his report on the situation as greatly exaggerated. He angrily refused to even consider evacuation of the Africa army. Goering promised Hitler that he would give the war in North Africa the decisive turn with his Luftwaffe. Goering had been angry with Rommel ever since the latter had remarked that the Goering divisions and the Waffen-SS were merely Praetorian guards and should be incorporated in the army. Rommel went back to his men, although it was suggested that he should take treatment for his tropical disease, all be brought with him was empty promises of support. On 13th of November, after all its stores and installations had been destroyed, Tobruk was taken by the British without a struggle. Much blood had been schist there on both sides during the previous eighteen months. The retreat through southern Cyrenaica was a masterly achievement by Rommel. Except for a great deal of materiel, we suffered hardly any losses. The fuel problem had become increasingly critical. Of the 250 tons promised by air transport, only 60 had arrived. With that we could cover just 150 kilometers and had to avoid getting into any battles. Thankfully, the heavy rain that I set in also prevented the British from pursuing us. Italian destroyers with fuel on board turned west. The Africa Corps was again left standing without fuel. With the last reserves, we managed to bring the motorized panzer units beside the Sirza El Drega line. Rommel was reckoning on a strong flanking attack around the Salt Lake south of Mersa El Brega. I had to reconnoiter with greater intensity in this area. At the same time, my reconnaissance group was broken up. The two Voss and Linau battalions were sent north. Only the Niza battalion remained with us. Gaussi called us again. Through lack of fuel, we cannot engage in a battle with the British at or south of Mersa El Braga. Everything points to a strong British attack. From 6th of December, the non-motorized German and Italian elements were moved to Tunisia, which was not easy, owing to shortage of petrol. The supply problem became ever more critical. Time and again, whole divisions or sections were left immobile. It was only thanks to great combat experience and outstanding morale that it was somehow contrived, again and again, to release them from encirclement as soon as some fuel could be organized. I had to give up the Fieseler Stork again. It was needed at HQ. I had to draw the net of patrols much tighter. Thank goodness our air reconnaissance to the south was intensified. In the course of it, we came to be attacked by our own fighters, who didn't expect to find us so far south. During air attacks, everyone had to leave his vehicle and lie flat on the sand, twenty to thirty yards away. The radio operator often stayed voluntarily at his post to send off our reports. Our aerial reconnaissance reported that to the south, a strong column, probably a complete British tank division, was preparing to outflank the Nophilia position. On 17 December, I moved my battalion north, where, with other elements of the Africa Corps, we launched an attack in the flank of this division. Together, we were able to knock out twenty British tanks with our 88s and, for the time being, avert the danger. 
While the remains of the Africa army were fighting for their lives on the coast and suffering constantly from shortage of fuel, we went back into the desert. The danger of a fresh attempt to outflank us remained too great. South of the Pshat line we came across our British friends again, and the old ceremonial of the five o'clock agreement was resumed. But we also stumbled on the tracks of the long-range desert group, tracks that led to the west. General Gauss sent word that the British had apparently been forced to make a pause since they had to reorganize their supply routes. But another outflanking attack was expected from the legendary Lieutenant Colonel Sterling. Our task, to reconnoiter more intensively as far as south of Holmes Tripoli, with particular attention to an almost insurmountable north-south mountain range between Holmes and Tripoli. The End in North Africa one afternoon, shortly before Christmas, toward four o'clock, I decided to drive to a hill some twelve kilometres to the south in the hope of getting a good view from there. Unthinkingly, I took a light armoured car without radio. I intended, after all, to be back by five o'clock. I ordered my driver to set off. I could detect nothing unusual and was setting off on the return journey. When I discovered right between me and my battalion, a fairly large British patrol which seemed to be settling there for the night. Fortunately, I was not spotted and at once withdrew a little to the south and then to the west. The terrain was difficult and I needed time to distance myself from the British. Meanwhile, it was getting dark and there was no chance of reaching my battalion. So, there I was, with no radio, but at least with my compass. By the last light of day, I saw a wadi in which I decided to hide for the night. As I came to the edge of it, I found a Bedouin family there with their camels and several tents. With a white cloth, I drove toward the Bedouins, who now all ran together, I and made myself known as a German. In a gibberish of Italian and Arabic, I outlined my situation and asked for hospitality for the night. Come, German, you are our guest. Nothing will happen to you, and tomorrow you will be guided back to your people safe and sound. We, too, are moving off tomorrow, to the south, until you and the British have gone away. As always, the women stayed in the tents and risked only surreptitious glances at the strangers. The family elder led us to the fireplace, and we squatted round it. A low fire was maintained with camel's thornwood, and over it hung three kettles from iron forks. The Arab tea ceremony then began. In one kettle, sugared water was boiled. In another, boiling water was poured over the tea leaves. And in the third kettle, the tea and the sugared water were mixed. The procedure was repeated continuously until, in the end, a strong, almost viscous tea was transferred to a pot. Little porcelain bowls in brass beakers were handed around and the most astonishing part of the ceremony then took place. The family elder took the porcelain bowls in turn, held the spout of the teapot close over them and as he poured, lifted the pot straight up so that, in the end, the stream of tea was flowing into the bowl from a height of over three feet without spilling a single drop. I was told later that in this way the tea became mixed with air bringing out its full aroma. It was said to be the pride of the Bedouins to be able to pour tea accurately into the little cups from the back of a camel. So, there we sat together, the Bedouin family, my driver and I. Meanwhile, night had fallen and the whole sky was covered in stars. Among them, one could recognise the Southern Cross. We were enveloped in an uncanny, beneficent peace. Without saying much, the men sat round the glimmering fire, which turned their faces a ruddy brown. I suddenly had the feeling that we might have been sitting there thousands of years before, or thousands of years hence, so timeless did it seem to us. For a few hours, we wrapped ourselves in our coats. The night was cold. Shortly before dawn, the Bedouins struck their tents. The family elder came to say goodbye. German, we are moving on now to the next waterhole. You must now travel on this camel track, here, for three hours. Then you will find another track that branches off to the right. You travel on that for five hours, till you come to a hill. 
from there you will see your friends. The British will not see you. We wish you the blessing of Allah, that you may return safe and sound to your country. A handshake, and he moved off with his camels into the desert. I have never understood how the man knew our position and that of the British so accurately. I converted the camel hours into scout car hours, took compass bearings, drove cautiously along the indicated tracks and came right on my battalion. There, great agitation had reigned. Shortly before dark, patrols had been sent out, which had found their way back to the battalion only by means of light signals without finding me. Finally, the Royal Dragoons and the 11th Hussars were asked if they had taken me prisoner. Sorry, unfortunately, no. We would have liked to greet your commander here. Christmas 1942 arrived, but we had no time to celebrate. In any case, how? Deep in the desert, without a tree or a bush, and in the heat of day, our thoughts turned to home, where our families were having to endure air raids and food rationing. On 31st December, New Year's Eve, Rommel came to see me unexpectedly in his Fieseler stork. He briefed me on the situation and his plans. Luck, some time or other, Tommy is going to launch another attack and outflank the Burat position in the south. I need the remains of the Panzer divisions in the north. The reconnaissance group will be reconstituted. In the next few days, Linau and Voss will join you, and you will get back the Fieseler stork, which will help you to reconnoitre. I am very concerned, Rommel went on, that the Americans, with their vast potential in weapons, might make a thrust from the Atlas Mountains and cut us off at Gabes from the 10th Army in northern Tunisia. Marshal Bastico shares my view that we cannot allow the Africa Army to be destroyed at Burat. I have suggested transferring the remains of the 21st Panzer Division to southern Tunisia, to rest them there and to ward off a possible American attack. Rommel then repeated what he had outlined to me some weeks earlier. I still think that, in view of the disastrous supply situation and the state of our men, who are certainly experienced but far from fresh, we can no longer turn this war around, let alone win it. So, I should like to get as many men and as much material as possible to Tunisia. There the opportunities for defence are better, and this is my main concern, as many men as possible can be saved by the short route to Sicily. Now to you, Rommel continued. With the reconnaissance group, you will secure for me the whole area south of Holmes and Tripoli. The British must, on no account, take us in the rear. Until the middle of January 1943, things remained quiet. On 13th January, the 21st Panzer Division was transferred to the Marath position in southern Tunisia and rested. As yet, the Americans were showing no signs of an eastward move from the rugged Atlas Mountains. Voss and Linau arrived with their battalions. So did the Fieseler. We kept watch in a broad fan to the south. Contacts were resumed with our friends on the other side. Very much to my surprise, my battalion was transferred to the area southwest of Tripoli for a few days, to be restored to strength. Major Voss took command of the rest of the reconnaissance group. The quiet spell in a palm grove did us good. Replacements of men, ammunition and fuel arrived. I used the opportunity for a brief visit to Tripoli. In the bar of the Owadan Hotel, the Italian barman served me a cocktail. I shall probably have to serve the next one to Montgomery, he said. The Italians took things more lightly. On 13th of January, I was back with the reconnaissance group. On the 14th, with massive artillery and air support, the British moved against the Burat position. They then made a strong thrust south of the Burat position toward Tarhuna Holmes, hence practically against Tripoli already. My reconnaissance group, along with elements of the 164th Division and the paratroops, were at once sent in to counter this move. Despite considerable losses in tanks, the thrust was continued fairly successfully toward Garian and Azizia. With that, the British were already southwest of Tripoli. Thanks to the long-range desert group, a complete tank division had found a route over a rugged mountain terrace. The Homs-Tardhunar position was in great danger. 
To avoid annihilation, Rommel had it evacuated. On 20th of January, we heard, even far to the south, the rumble of explosions in Tripoli. As I discovered later, through the superhuman efforts of the supply units, about 95% of the stores were moved to safety from Tripoli in the direction of Tunisia. All harbour and supply installations were blown up and the food depots handed over to the Italian mayor. On 23rd January, the British occupied Tripoli without a fight. A few days later, as we were covering the disengagement of our units southwest of Tripoli, a patrol reported gathering of high military personnel about six to eight kilometers to the northeast, believe Monty identified, strong protection with tanks and scout cars. I went there at once and scanned the scene with binoculars. It really did seem to be Montgomery, and, much more sensationally, Churchill appeared to be with him, wearing a safari helmet. It was too far to open fire with our weapons. 80 silent men and guns and artillery were not available. I, at once, sent a radio message to Gauss. Churchill and Monty believed located at great distance, no action possible. Actually, I thought about what Rommel said about Churchill and held my fire. Later, I heard that it could well have been Churchill, who, on his way to Casablanca, had stopped off to see Monty and his troops. However that may be, we never saw Hitler in this theatre of war, or even senior officers of the high command of the Wehrmacht, the OKW. In January, Lieutenant Colonel Sterling of the Long Range Desert Group was finally captured. Nice to meet you, was his first remark. I shall be glad to spend a few days with you and perhaps meet your famous Marshal Rommel. He was taken to headquarter under heavy guard. A day or two later, he promptly escaped. After a mistaken deal with Bedouins, however, he was handed back to us. The British paused to organize their supplies. By an immense effort, continually harassed by the RAF, we were able to bring all our units over the Libyan-Tunisian border to the Marith position. With the reaching of Tunisia, the reconnaissance group was again dissolved. I also had to relinquish the Fieseler again, unfortunately. I received orders to stop, or at least report, any approach by British units south of Marath. I was to pay particular attention to the track that led north from the desert fort of Fum Tatuin. That was where the French column was expected, which, in an unprecedented feat, was supposed to strike from Chad through the Sahara against our southern flank. It failed to reach Tunisia in time. I sent a liaison officer to Rommel's headquarter to learn something about the situation and about intentions for the future in our struggle in Tunisia. On his return, he told me that Rommel seemed to be planning an attack through the American-held passes in the Atlas Mountains in order to score a hit against the completely untried Americans and thrust north in their rear. Reconnaissance Battalion 3 was to hold itself ready for this operation. Shortly after, an orderly officer arrived from Rommel with an anti-aircraft platoon and one of light artillery. Major, he said, your task is as follows. Since Rommel considers it possible that the British may attempt a wide outflanking movement from the south, or that the French combat group may turn up, your reinforced battalion is to advance on Fort Foum Tatooine, capture the French garrison, and from there, reconnoitre to the south and southeast. If no enemy is observed, your combat group will return at once to the Mareth position. You will set off for the south tomorrow morning. Radio contact must be maintained without fail. Well spread out, we made good progress at first, until a British reconnaissance plane flew over us, circled and flew off again. That was sinister. I sent off a radio message to Gauze. Expect air attack on my combat group. Can you alert our fighters? Progress toward Foom Tatooine, otherwise good. Then they came. Flying out of the sun and low over the ground, the hurricanes attacked protected by Spitfires, which kept watch high above them. No special orders were needed. All movement ceased. Every man left his vehicle and lay flat on the sand 30 yards away. My motorcycle escorts opened fire with their machine guns, but without success. 
we didn't know that the Hurricanes were armoured on the underside. Their target was the Flak Platoon anti-aircraft platoon, which was eliminated before it could fire a shot. On their second run-up, the artillery platoon was hit and its vehicles badly damaged. As fast as they had come, the fighters turned away again. Everything had lasted only a few minutes. The Hurricanes must have seen my armoured reconnaissance vehicles. I figured we were in for a second attack. Again, I sent off a radio message. Have been attacked by Hurricanes, Flak and artillery platoons, largely out of action. Anticipate fresh attack, send Messerschmitts. The British bases must have been close behind the front. After barely an hour, they were back again. This time, it was the turn of our armoured vehicles. With dismay, I saw only a few yards away how the Hurricanes fired rockets, which went straight through our armour. That was new to us. The only one to remain in his vehicle was my radio operator, who was sending off my messages. Next to the vehicle stood my intelligence officer, who passed on to the operator what I shouted across to him. Then a machine I thought I recognised the Canadian emblem approached for a low-flying attack on the armoured radio station. At 20 yards, I could clearly see the pilot's face under his flight helmet, but instead of shooting, he signalled with his hand for the radio officer to clear off and pulled his machine up into a great curve. Get the operator out of the vehicle, I shouted, and take cover, the pair of you. The machine had turned and now came at us out of the sun for the second time. This time, he fired his rockets and hit the radio car, fortunately, without doing too much damage. This attitude of the pilot, whether he was Canadian or British, became for me the example of fairness in this merciless war. I shall never forget the pilot's face or the gesture of his hand, except for two vehicles which we had to abandon. All were in running order, though we had to take several in tow with our tracked motorcycles. But the British fighters were still circling over us. We had to anticipate a third attack. Suddenly, a squadron of Messerschmitts appeared high in the sky and at once engaged the British in an air battle. They moved off to the north, but not before we saw one British machine go down after being hit. So, at least a third attack had been prevented, and we had the satisfaction of one shot down. We at once moved off again toward Foom Tatooine. We were now in the middle of the desert, which, in this part, was flat and provided easy going. By radio, I notified General Gauss. And then we saw the little desert fort lying before us. A heap of stones piled on top of each other, not a tree or a bush. What an enervating existence for the garrison, to keep watch there for months or years. We were met by machine gun fire, which we very quickly silenced with our own MG24. Secured by our motorcycle escorts and two guns that were still intact and under the immediate protection of armoured cars, I drove into the fort. A French captain came toward us. His men had laid down their weapons and raised their hands. Why are you still here? I asked him. Now that the front has moved on to Tunisia. We've been stationed here for over a year, he replied. Our task is to keep the fort manned. I have no other orders. I went with him into his bare office, where I saw a radio set. At a sign from me, it was put out of action by my intelligence officer. Regard yourself and your men as prisoners, I told him. Pack whatever you need. I shall have to take you with us. Meantime, all the elements of my little combat group had appeared in the fort and searched it for weapons. I, at once, sent out patrols to the south and the southeast, which reported no contact with the enemy. I radioed to Gauss. Foam Tatooine occupied. Garrison taken prisoner, radio destroyed, reconnaissance far to the south, no contact with enemy, am returning to Mareth position with combat group and several vehicles in tow. We were still a good 50 kilometres from Mareth when it became dark. I decided to stay in the middle of the desert for the night. There was little danger. The British also suspended their movements during the night. The next day, we reached the Mareth lines unmolested and were withdrawn behind them as reserves for further actions. I used the opportunity to be briefed by General Gauss. Rommel's idea, said Gauss, 
is to use the freshly equipped 21st Panzer Division in collaboration with the newly arrived 10th Panzer Division of Colonel General von Arnim, along with all available elements of the Africa Corps, to disrupt American concentrations, prevent an advance against the coast, and thrust as deeply as possible into the American rear. Because of the Americans' complete lack of experience, said Gauss, Rommel considers this operation to be very promising. The Italians are to consolidate the Mareth position and hold it by every means, although a defensive position at and west of Gabes would have been very much more favourable because of the salt lakes. But Mussolini and the Italian Commando Supremo insisted on the Mareth position. Unfortunately, the collaboration with von Arnim didn't go very well. He likes to be his own boss, Gauss concluded. Thank goodness the heavy rains are still with us, as they make it almost impossible for the RAF to be used. Your battalion will reconnoiter west of Gabes to prevent our elements of the 5th Panzer Army, in the north, from being cut off. Rommel's health is not good, but he wants to stick it out with his men and calculates that he still has a chance if his plan is approved. We took hope again and made ourselves familiar with the terrain, which was so different from the desert. In the Atlas Mountains, we would be concerned with passes and steep mountain tops, in the plain with salt lakes, and, further north, with cultivated land. Rommel has just received a radio message from the Commando Supremo, Gorse went on, to the effect that, owing to his poor state of health, on reaching the Mareth position, he is to relinquish command of it to the Italian General Messe, who, up to now, has been commanding the Italian Expeditionary Corps in Russia. Rommel can determine the date of his relief. Rommel's plan seems to be aimed at two solutions. Either we receive, from Sicily, all the necessary material in tanks including the superior Tiger, anti-tank weapons, ammunition and massive air support, or we try to thrust deep into the rear of the Americans, occupy the main passes, and hold up the British at the Marath position, in order, by this means, to evacuate from Tunisia the mass of battle-tried troops urgently needed in Europe. The second solution, unfortunately, would seem to be the most likely. Hold yourself ready for a thrust against the Americans. While the Italians settled in to defend the Marath position, the fully restored 21st Panzer Division moved against the Fayyid Pass on 1st February 1943, to create a starting point for the northward attack behind the American lines. The surprised and inexperienced Americans lost the pass, and 1,000 prisoners, my old division, set out from the Fayyid Pass bridgehead to the north and came upon elements of the 2nd American Armoured Division. In hard battles, tank against tank, the bulk of this American division was destroyed, and a large number of Grant, Lee, and Sherman tanks left burning on the battlefield. In its pursuit, the 21st Division managed to gain further territory against the remaining American elements, now fighting grimly 